And that was me. I was about to hit a mountain and I had a choice to make. I'm either going to hit this mountain or I'm going to repent, come back to the Lord and say, you know, here I am. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you'll take me, here I am. And that was, that was kind of the way I was thinking, is that God could never use me again. And I got where I was by day, day by day staying out of the Word. It wasn't like I made one conscious decision, eh, I'm done. Wow. And I went back to my seat and I was like, okay. Maybe I still can be. You know, mm-hmm. I need, that was what I needed just to say, you know, God's way of saying, look, you can still be used. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Winning Conversations. We are here with the Philians. Yes. It's actually the Philians. I will say it properly. Yeah. It's uh, Kitty and Jeremiah. Yeah. They are here with us today. Thank you so much. How are Thank you guys you doing? Much. Good. Very good. Very well. We're really glad you're here. We are. Yeah. This is actually going to be a fun conversation because I think people always see you. I always see you mm-hmm. looking just dapper every oh, time. Very studious. <laughs> and then you work in the green room yep. as well. So, so I'm hiding most of the time. Like, that's what's so funny is like we don't see you. We always see you. But together, mm-hmm. a dynamic duo of, you know. We r- rarely get to sit together, too. She's usually on the other side of the auditorium for me. So some people don't make usually. that connection. Like, yeah. oh, you guys yeah. go together. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, when we see you guys hugging, like, oh, whoa, now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Scandal. Uh, no. Um, so this is going to be an exciting one because I think people don't know you. Like, for instance, I, I know your son, Gabriel. Mm-hmm. I get the pleasure of teaching him in the youth. But I don't get to talk to you guys much. And you guys have an amazing story, like what brought you here and everything else. So if it's okay with you, can we start there? Mm-hmm. Well, we had been married by that point for like six years. And obviously, you're first starting out, you don't have a lot of money. So okay, yeah. we had started like listening to a whole bunch of different preachers and things that I had listened to since I was a kid. He wasn't quite as familiar, but he got introduced and like, well, you know, we can we can go to Southwest Believers Convention. It's Fort Worth. Let's go. Let's go. It's not too out. far of a drive. So we drove down, walked in, enjoyed it. We're like, well, if we're going down there, well, we're going to go to church, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, he's, he's got a church. Okay. Yeah. You been, meant Dr. Seville, right? Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Seville, yeah. We, about a year before, I had been in a training class here in DFW. He was going to come down and visit. We were going to come to church here and see it, but it didn't quite work out. So, okay, well, let's do it this time. Mm-hmm. Walked in, and we looked at each other and went, this feels like home. This, this feels right. Yeah, we, okay. we didn't we didn't have a lot of money, and so it was kind of a vacation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, we lived in Kansas City at the time, and uh, so Fort Worth wasn't far, and it was cheaper to visit. <laughs> so uh, and, and we wanted to go to the Believers Convention, so it was kind of all, all one package deal. And while we were in town, we noticed av- as we drove around that the whole Dallas-Fort Worth ma- area, as we drove around, just felt like home, which is odd. I've never been a big mm-hmm. city person anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. But I was like, something about this just feels like home. And, and she felt the same way. And we got to ho- our hotel and we started looking around online at, you know, like houses for sale. And I was like, oh, my God, are we really thinking about this? You know, mm-hmm. and then yeah. I had been listening to Jerry Safel for quite a while. And I was like, hey, Jerry Savelle's church is here. Let's go visit while we're in town. And we walked in the front door at Heritage of Faith, and it was, I mean, immediately just knew this is this is where we belong. Mm. There was, you know, no voice, or it was just, we just knew, like, this is it. This is our home. And we walked in and, and sat down, and Pastor Justin gets up, and I'm like, who's, who's this guy? Where, where's Jerry Savelle? I, I thought Jerry Savelle was the pastor. And, uh, and Pastor Justin was, you know, awesome as always. And it was like, this is, this is home. This is definitely home. And so we started at that point uh, making plans to move, mm-hmm. which didn't actually happen until 2012. T- 2012 uh, she moved. We were not able to sell the house right away. So I stayed behind to sell the house, which didn't happen for a long time. So we Very wound up, time. I stayed for a year, about about a year. And we wound up renting the house because we couldn't sell. The market was bad at the time. We couldn't you, sell it. You guys were <laughs> living in two different yes. states, states for yes. an entire year, a year of your marriage. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. How'd that go? It was, was rough. It was not fun. There was... Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine that. <laughs> yeah. mid, well, midway, trips, midway <laughs> trips to like Tulsa, Oklahoma City, that kind of thing. We, we, right. A couple yeah. times I drove up to do things. Like I was right. working on the house a couple times, but... Yeah, it was it was interesting. It's one of those. If I didn't know that I was supposed to be doing this, I wouldn't be yeah. doing this. Yeah, because it was it was, it was a, a rough tough season. Year. Oh yeah. yeah. Plus, I just moved my parents down here because we had told them when we went back up, hey, you know, um, we're gonna we're gonna move. 
really? Well, I'm, I'm going to retire soon, so we're going to find a house. So that was one of the other things we did was we looked around for a house for my parents to move nice. to. So I ended up staying with them. That was an act of faith, too. I love them, but the, my sister was living next door, and there was a point where I'm going, are you sure, God? Because <laughs> I, I love my family, but I kind of, I sure. also want to have my husband with me. So a year Naturally. later, he shows up. It was a rough year. Yeah. Uh, about once a month, we would meet up in either Oklahoma, Oklahoma City or Tulsa, a roughly halfway point, mm-hmm. yeah. Kansas City and, and Fort Worth. And uh, finally, um, I just decide I'm done. We're just going to rent the house. Um you know, I'm a, I'm a cop. I can go find a job anywhere. So um, we started, I started looking at jobs and then uh, moved down and we rented the house and I'll never be a landlord again. Um, that was not, that was not fun, especially when you're in another state. Right. Um, but it was, yeah, it was not an enjoyable experience, but thankfully um, one of the things we had been believing for, for a long time was selling that house. And we did that. This year. Early this year, we wow. sold it. Yeah. And the interesting thing, the amazing testimony with that is, had we sold it at the time, back in t- uh, 2012, 2013, uh, we probably would have taken a loss or we certainly wouldn't have made a profit on it. And by hanging on to it, all those years that I didn't want to hang on to it, um, we were able to sell it for an amazing profit. And so that yes, was certainly yes. a blessing. And we had been believing for that for a long time. And it was shortly after the beginning of this year, we finally, finally got it sold. And that was a, that was a hallelujah. Yes, that's <laughs> a big deal. Well, and yes. the reason I asked you that, I knew those story, the story, the most pieces of that story and that that was a tough transition for you is because people always see the end result and they see how you're doing now. Yeah. And for, they don't get to hear mm. that it took, there's no. a little bit of, there's a little bit of friction involved yeah. in, mm-hmm. in making that move down here. Yes. So it was not fast. It was not overnight. Yeah. It was not easy. Mm. Uh, it was not pleasant <clears throat> really. Mm. I mean, no. um, being here is, it's just that whole process. Sure. But you mentioned something that you are a police officer and that is not a popular position to be in nowadays. <laughs> Um, it's one of those things whenever I meet officers, I'm always taken aback because there's a a perspective the media gives you like right now is hypertension when it comes to like just the profession. So like you've walked through it, you've had a couple different positions inside the force. Could you give us a little bit of a background on that? Yeah. So I started, uh, been almost 22 years now in law enforcement. I started at a sheriff department in Missouri. Uh, I started out working in the jail. Um, then went to patrol and then from patrol went to narcotics, uh, from narcotics, went to computer crimes. And then, uh, that was when I left there is when I moved here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then starting at a new department, it's back to patrol, uh, was there for a short time, then, um, went to investigations and, uh, did that up until, uh, January of 2020 when I got promoted to Sergeant and, um, took over a, an administrative role as a training, training and personnel Sergeant. Okay. Um, it's a, it's one of those positions that, you know, who's going to do this? I ah, just put it on the, tack it on to this, this position, you know, who's going to do this? Ah, tack it on this position. And I, I, I wear a lot of hats, very, very busy, uh, mostly administrative stuff. I mean, I'm not out on the street anymore and, um, it's nice, you know, when the it's 112 outside, I'm, I'm, I'm in an air conditioned office, so I can't complain. <laughs> um, but the, the perception, what you said, the perception is, um, about law enforcement is what's unfortunate because the truth is, you know, law enforcement is a great profession and law enforcement officers, the vast majority of them are great people. Um, no ill will, you know, they're just have a job to do. And honestly, I think the, um, perception that law enforcement officers have of the public is that a lot of people don't like most people don't like cops. And, and really the truth is most people that we meet are um, very, very friendly to us. They come up, shake our hand. Hey, thank you for your service. I can't tell you how many times I've had meals bought for me by people I didn't even know. Mm-hmm. I'd go to a restaurant, I'd go to pay the meal and they're like, oh, it's already been paid, you know, or, and, and I really appreciate that. Um, it's just that because of pub, uh, uh, social media, the, the American news media, um, the, the, the perception is, that you know, law enforcement is, you know, racist or they're 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 this or they're that, and they're really just good people trying to do a job. Uh, there's bad apples, but you'll find that in any profession. Sure. Um, but it's it's important for us in law enforcement to realize that not everyone hates you. Not everyone, you know, if you turn on the news, you would get that impression. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, which I don't watch the news. 
Um, What's it like being a believer though? As a, <clears throat> that's what I always like, like, you know, that, I mean, obviously you're here, you're a believer. Right. What's that like when you're in your profession? Um, well, extremely helpful. <laughs> um, the grace to get through certain things, certain assignments. Uh, and I mentioned I was in computer crimes. That was specifically a uh, internet crimes against children task force. Wow. And so it was a lot of child pornography, child enticement. Um, and this was in sort of early days of the internet. I started that in 2008. So at this point, you know, Facebook was four years old and Facebook really only started coming into its own about 2008, 2009. When I started, MySpace was still the I thing. I was just going to say, I think MySpace was the it, jam. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It was. I learned how to put like the music on yes. your face. I yeah. still know yeah. Tom. Good friend of mine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that, that was... You know, it was five and a half years I was on that task force, and it was some of the hardest uh, uh, work I've ever done, just the material, hard to deal with. Yeah. You see the worst of mankind, um, but it was also the most rewarding because, you know, you'd put people in prison, and they would actually, I mean, they went to prison. Yeah. So it was Serious a problems. really, really good feeling, knowing that, really feeling like I'm making a difference. Mm -hmm. But right. without the Lord, I don't, I, I couldn't have done that. Um, I don't know how just anybody can just do that position. It, it took a special grace and I'm very grateful um, to, to have been able to do that. And it didn't, didn't affect me. Mm. I mean, there are people who, who work in there that have to go to therapy and they, you know, um, a lot of times now we'll actually have counselors set aside for the investigators because you, you're doing these cases and they want you to go talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're not a believer, that's, I, mean, I guess that's how you deal with it. I, I didn't need that you know, thankfully, because I had the grace mm -hmm. to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's that was a care I could cast on the Lord. And I mean, it didn't, it didn't affect me. Mm -hmm. So I was very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. How do you see your relationship with God and being a man of God um, impacting the role you do now, administratively? Well, it, I'm very fortunate to be in the position that I am, because I do the hiring for my department. And, you know, everyone likes to feel like what you're doing is making a difference. And, um, having a say in, you know, the future of this profession, at least at our department is, is kind of a big deal. And we've, you know, she's been standing with me and believing for the right people, uh, mm -hmm. to come mm -hmm. and that I'll see the right people and see the wrong people and know how to, how to weed them out. And, uh, so it's very important to me, um, because this is a job I take seriously and I'm, um, you know, it's a, it's a great profession and I want it to remain that way. And so it's important to get good people, people of integrity. Um, I would love to hire nothing but believers, but you know, I'm, I, I'm not allowed to say, Oh, you're not, you're not a believer. I can't <laughs> right. hire you, but I am allowed to say, you know, you're showing these indications that you don't have integrity or no responsibility or whatever. And right. you have to, you have to have these things uh, to be able to cross that finish yeah. line. Good. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's something I take seriously is selecting that next generation. Well, police officers have to have a pretty high mm. moral bar, yeah. whether they're believers or not. Absolutely. And I think that's part of the part of the job, part of the reason why it takes just the right yes. kind of person. Integrity is the name of the game in law enforcement. Um, you've all seen on the news officers that have given that up, and they'll never they'll mm. never be officers again. Mm. Um, if if you lie, um, you you lie on a report, you do something, anything dishonest, you're you're done as a mm. cop. You cannot be a cop. You have to maintain that high level of integrity. And uh, that's that's something I demand out of every applicant, or you will not advance. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Now my question for you is, what is it like to be a police officer's wife, and how has that been over the years? It's been interesting, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, there's a lot of prayer that goes involved. I'm sure. I've had, especially when they had the dart shootings. I had people asking me, how how can you be okay with him going? Dart shootings. Um, when there was the shootings, what, what year was that? It was the five officers that were killed in oh, Dallas, Dallas in 2016. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Dart yeah. officer was one of yes. the ones that was killed. There it were took several. Me a minute to yeah. Get there. Okay. Sorry about that. That's right. <laughs> but it was. I had people ask me, "How how are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. How can I not be okay with it?" I knew when we started dating what he was going to do. I saw him in a dream years before we ever met, and I knew. This person was going to be my husband. Mm -hmm. I met him, and I knew God has me linked up with him for a reason. My job is to support him, mm -hmm. to take care of him. Like, when we go out in public, I know very well that he's going to insert himself if there's something happening. 
Sure. My job is to support him by him not having to worry about me mm-hmm. taking care of the people with us. Mm-hmm. But it's like I pray for him. I pray mm-hmm. for the people he's with. I always look at the I eyeball everybody he has ever had as a partner. Because it's like, if I don't like you, <laughs> I'm praying you out of his life. <laughs> just just, <laughs> just be out. honest. Straight I'm just going to be straight out. Yeah. If I, if I, I can't that. trust you and I feel that in here, yeah. mm-mm, no, 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 you're not, you're not, not staying. staying. Husband, yeah. No, you're not going to watch his back. Mm-hmm. I don't like you. I know there's something mm-hmm. wrong with you. You're not staying. I did pray a couple of those people out of your life before. Thank so, you. yes. <laughs> Good that, wife. That, that's yeah. just part of it. <laughs> yeah. Because other than that, if you don't have that peace that you know that God's going to take care of him, mm-hmm. what, why are you doing this? Right. Plus, it's also I know that God's got me. He's got Gabe. So if anything ever, whatever was to happen to him, okay, I'm good. Mm-hmm. I'm still fine. I know he's fine. Because mm-hmm. I know he didn't, nothing's wrong. I'm not separated. He just stepped right. over. Right. That was to ever happen, right? So I think from that perspective, it makes it makes it much easier, right? Just because I know, and for those other the wives who don't know, mm-hmm. or the husbands who don't know, mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen them freaking out because they they got the call saying, "Oh, someone's got hurt. What mm-hmm. what happened? Are they okay? Are they okay?" He's good. Mm-hmm. I know he's good, no matter what. That's awesome. That's mm-hmm. a good place to be. Good yes. peaceful place to be, yeah. especially as a wife and a mother. Uh, yeah. It makes a big difference. It does. It makes a huge difference. We kind of started before. Like people kind of see the finished work. Mm-hmm. Or they see where you're at now and they assume rainbows and Skittles. <laughs> you know, like, oh, right. look at this beautiful Look at them. Couple. Yeah. How easy is life <laughs> for you guys? You know, <clears throat> and they don't realize what goes on, like what it took to get to where you're at, like the struggles, the hardships. <laughs> yes. And you have a significant one that I really identify with, but I want, I want you to tell your, your, your little season, I guess, was, what, however you want to describe that. I'll let you do it. So shortly after we moved here, um, we uh, we were not faithful in going to church regularly and staying in the Word and and keeping first things mm-hmm. first. Um, we we go occasionally. You know, we live. We've always lived on the north side of Fort Worth. A bit of a drive, and you know that was an excuse. Ah, it's kind of far. Ah, we don't need to go. We can go next week. And mm-hmm. it was always next week. And it was always next week. And next week never came. Mm-hmm. And. Then it was like, eh, I don't really have time to spend in the Word. I don't have time to spend in prayer. And and next thing I know, I mean, I'm just living like everyone else lives. You would never know by my looking at the way I lived that I was a believer. And we just stopped going to church. I don't even know how long. Um, I wasn't spending any time in the Word, wasn't spending any time in prayer. And I was, I was a mess, and I didn't realize I was a mess. And um, was living in complete disobedience to the Lord and had a wake-up call. It was um, 2018. I wound up in the emergency room with extremely high blood pressure, heart palpitations. I thought I was having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And they're like, wow, your blood pressure's high. They did all the scans, everything in the ER. And like, you're fine. You didn't have a heart attack. I'm like, well, what's wrong with me? Like, your blood pressure's high. I'm like, okay. Um. (laughs) Can you help more than that? You know, any right. information would be good. No. Um, no. And then it was just, I, I kept having these manifestations of problems all throughout my body. Mm-hmm. And it was like, okay, let's go get a scan and get that checked out. Oh, there's nothing there. Like, what do you mean there's nothing there? And I'm telling you, something's, you know, everything seemed to be going wrong. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just, it was an attack of the enemy is exactly what it was. In, in hindsight, I can look back now and see, I was living in disobedience. I had left myself open to attack. This was not God trying to teach me a lesson. Mm -hmm. I walked out of the will of God and was wide open. Mm -hmm. You know, the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I was over there going, hey, rub myself down with a steak pretty much. You know, (laughs) hey, come eat me. That was pretty much what I had done, you know, Mm -hmm. made myself vulnerable. And so it was on me. I knew that. And uh, I, I, (laughs) there's there's a sermon that Keith Moore preached that I love. It's called Love's Correction. And uh, he's a pilot, and he made the analogy of corrections like you would make as a pilot flying an airplane. And in general, when you're flying to a destination, you would make small corrections because you have passengers back there, and you don't want to spill their drink. You want to keep them comfortable, so you make these very small corrections. But if you pop out of a cloud, and suddenly there's a mountain right in front of you, he's like, I'm going to spill your drink. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going we're gonna to hard bank this thing. We're going to make a really hard correction to keep from crashing into this mountain. And that was me. I was about to hit a mountain, and I had a choice to make. I'm either going to hit this mountain or I'm going to repent, come back to the Lord, and say, you know, here I am. Mm-hmm. You, you know, if, if you'll take me, here I am. 
And that was, that was kind of the way I was thinking, as God could never use me again. And came back to church, um, got back involved in church. We were here every Sunday, every Wednesday. And at first it was out of desperation. And then after that it was out of this passion that I, I don't want to get back to where I was. Mm-hmm. And I got where I was by day, day by day, staying out of the word. It wasn't like I made one conscious decision and eh, I'm done with God right. and walked away. It was the little things. It was the little, we Slow don't need fade. to go. We don't need to go to church <laughs> this week. Oh, that's fine. Well, yep. you know, oh, I'll, I'll read the Bible later and later never came. Mm-hmm. And so that's why first things first is so, so important. Um, because you make these little bitty, um, decisions not to do this. And those little decisions become Mm-hmm. big problems. And so I remember one Wednesday night I was at, I was, I had come to church and, um, I don't know why I remember this, but I was wearing this shirt. I don't know. It just, it just dawned on me. Um, I, I just thought <laughs> That's of that. That's great. But, um, I have three shirts. This is one of them. Yes. <laughs> and I thinking I, I was still feeling like I, I was on my way to being where I need to be, but I was still feeling like God could never use me again. You know, I was, I was listening to the lies of the enemy that you're beyond he's, he's done with you. And pastor had called for people to come up for prayer. I don't remember what for, but then he looks over at me. He has no idea who I am. I was not serving at this time. And he says, come, come up here. So I came up, I'm like freaked out. Like what, what do we do? And he says, I want you to pray for this guy right here. Mm. And so I was like, okay. So I laid my hands on him and I heard these words come out of me. I said, in the name of Jesus, every chain is broken. And the guy hit the floor and rolling around, grunting, growling. And I'm, I'm standing here like, I have no idea what to do. And Pastor Justin was right there, knelt down and cast something out of this guy, some kind wow. of demon. And he got up delivered. Wow. And I went back to my seat and I was like, okay, maybe I still can be. You know, mm-hmm. I need, that was what I needed just to say, you know, God's way of saying, look, you're, you can still be used. Isn't this like God's good like that? Yeah. He is. He's I just, so generous. Just perfect yeah. like that. And one thing, going going back to the moving down here uh, that I, I forgot to mention, um, when we were praying about moving, my directive was get involved at Heritage of Faith and serve. Didn't know where. I didn't know if that was usher or greeter. Didn't care. He said serve. So once I got back on track after that, I was like, okay, I need to serve, but I didn't know what to do. Uh, and it wasn't very long after that that incident on that Wednesday night, uh, Eric Leonard tracked me down <laughs> and he's like, Hey, and he said, and he said, he said, Hey, would you like to, you know, join our, join our team, David's team. And I don't know if they were aware I was a cop or not. Yeah, that, that was my fault. That was your, oh, you told yes, okay. I had, so, I had good met, wife again. Yes, yes. Good wife. Yeah. I, had, you know, that I, Brad, yeah. I, I met Brad out front and I'm like, you know, chatting with him one day and I had Gabe with me. Just, we're just talking, and I'd come by, and I said, you know, thank you for doing what you're doing, because my husband's a cop, and we can't go places Brad without, Sims him, is who she's without him about. having yeah, his head yeah. on a swivel. Officer he's Sims. never, he's sure. never not looking, right? Ever, and he's actually relaxed, and he's actually able to listen, and he's not constantly like eyeballing at people and doors and things. And I think that's kind of how he's like, oh, <clears throat> this one. <laughs> there's this a, one. there's an officer in our yeah. midst. Go get yeah. him. Go get him. <laughs> Watch my thumb. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened <laughs> so anyway so and then uh yeah and then it was i think september 18 yeah. mm-hmm. uh i joined joined the team and been serving ever since yeah. and i don't remember when you started serving in the green room. uh december december yeah. and for those just for context our david's team is our security team that helps keep mm-hmm. us safe mm-hmm. keeps uh keeps things in top top shape making sure we're all <clears throat> above bar well i think it's cool you protect the front of the house and you protect the back, back of the house. Yep, yeah. And for people to know restaurants, that's, <laughs> that's verbiage for the restaurant world. Yes. But yes, like <laughs> the green room, which is an insanely important place to be. Yeah. Cause like the anointing that's in that room yep. is on, like, you know, what goes on there is what comes out and gets every one of us. Yeah. And that's such a cool place to be. Like mm-hmm. what a special spot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fun. I get the opportunity to do what I do like serving not in the sense of like, oh, I'm like physically walking around with cookies or something. Mm-hmm. But I find out what people's preferences are. My grandmother's thing was always, when you come over to my house, I expect you to sit down and have co- cookies, coffee. If you haven't had that, you haven't sat down. We haven't chatted. Mm-hmm. You haven't really come. Mm-hmm. But if you go over for a meal with her, especially if it was a birthday or she knew you were coming and you were a special guest, she would always find one dish. What is this person's favorite thing? Mm-hmm. I want to know one thing. 
and she would find that one thing for that person and she would have it there for them. So that's part of what I get to do is I get to find out what's that one thing mm. at a particular time. Is it someone's mm. birthday? Cool. I happen to be that Sunday. Let's bring them something special. Mm-hmm. What do they like the best? Mm-hmm. Or just for the worship team, making sure that they, they're, they're loved too. Because, I mean, they need food. Yeah. Preach. So, you know, food, everyone. <laughs> well, and that is, uh, I always see the green room as uh, anointing protector piece yep. that helps Make sure that our yeah the <laughs> minus, buffer the buffer that helps sure. make sure people yeah. are, are ready. It's you know? so important. Mm-hmm. It's so important. So I just see both gifts really working together, and you guys. Mm-hmm. And one thing we didn't have time to touch on a whole lot was the fact that you're Thrive Group leaders also. Yes, and we and, feed the people, and you feed the people yes. very well. <laughs> Sounds like so that's I've the heard. Thrive Group that gets oh, yes. fed well. Yeah. Well, the Thrive Group that we started in was well down here, Penny and Kevin. Right. Oh, they're awesome. And yeah. the the Bullises at the time were the leaders and we ended up being like their kind of junior assistants. Right. And that kind of got us started and they're like, you know, you, you should do a Thrive group. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. We'll just stay what we're doing right now. Yeah. And then later it's like, no, you need to do the Thrive group. Yeah. Go, go do Thrive you group. You have the heart. <laughs> so yeah. now we, we have a house where we can actually have people sit down and come and we feed them. Mm-hmm. You've witnessed this. Yeah. The food is we phenomenal. We and I, I have been able to go to lots of Thrive Groups. Yes, I know you have. In my administrative <laughs> position, so I, uh, they do have some of the very best food of all the Thrive Groups. You not keep, trying to set the bar. Their thrive group, you know? We do, uh, we super do high, but right? we do themes. That's great. They do, they do a great job. But you also love on the people well, and you relate to them well, which kind of um, – is part of who we are as a church at that restoration you talked about mm-hmm. Jeremiah and, and how God brought you back around. You see God be gentle with people in those places when they come to thrive groups, it's like an opportunity for, mm-hmm. for those kind of things, people to come up to another level, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. cause they, they can connect with you on that. Um, you know, heritage is all about making winners in life. Mm-hmm. When you think about that statement in light of what we've talked about, Oh, it's time. It is time. I love it. It's my favorite part. Exactly. I love it. Sorry. These are, this is our favorite part of the podcast. Yeah. So, uh, but we want to know what that statement, making winners in life, means. Well, for me, um, you know, Pastor Justin has said numerous times, I think he brings this up at every Connect class, that this is a place of restoration. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very fitting that the founding pastor, Jerry Savelle, was in the paint and body you know, automobile restoration business before he started this church. Now he's in the people restoration business. Yeah, that's good. Um, because I came in a wrecked car, and um, I am, I'm not going to say I'm showroom quality, but I mean, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm a lot better than I was. Let's I'd put, put you in the way. cover of a magazine <laughs> right now. So, you know, making winners in life to me, to me is about taking a wreck and making them you know, making them shine. Yeah. And because I, I came in here feeling like a complete wreck and can f- feeling like I would never be able to be any good to anybody, you know, let alone God. And, you know, sitting under the, the teaching in this house, um, I have learned that no, you absolutely, you know, he's not done. God's not done with me, not done with you, not done with any of us. Um, all you need is the desire to do it, the desire and to serve or to do what he wants you to do. And uh, he can work with that. And so to me, making winners in life is all about restoration. Mm. Solid. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a great analogy, too. I, I don't like think that. I have to talk after that, but <laughs> <laughs> I find, fine. Um, I had to think about that. Well, to me, it's more about competing with myself in the sense of, I know I have a goal. He has a plan for me, but each day I have to be a little better than I was yesterday. So it's baby steps, Mm -hmm. but just knowing that God doesn't expect me to compete against you, you or him. I mean, that's, that's craziness. I'm an individual and he has an ideal picture of who I'm supposed to be. Right. And my goal is to get better every day to be that person. And sometimes like when I'm loving on people like Thrive Group, they need a little love so that they feel like, okay, I can take that next step. I can do it. Mm -hmm. I know today sucked, but tomorrow can be better. Okay. Give me your hand. Let's go. We can take a step together. And that's kind of what it is, mm. just being better every day, one step, just one step. It's not huge, but it, all those little steps, they get you there. That's a great answer. That's awesome. That's it's a great good. answer because that's been your guys' story. It's like mm-hmm. you just like one day at a time, one decision at a time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we make one more right decision, one more right mm-hmm. decision. It really leads you into the will of God and where, where he's called you all. So yeah. um, I have to say you guys are a precious couple. I love, we love you guys very much. We're <laughs> yeah. so thankful mm-hmm. God brought you guys here. So thank you for being part of our house and part of our show. I know. Podcast. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so there's so many power couples in this church. You guys, I, sure. and we throw that Can't term around stand. loosely. It's all <laughs> shotgun style. No, we don't. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I was like, no, we don't. Wait, what? Like, there really are like just amazing couples in this ministry. And you guys are one of those couples that just do so much together. I think a lot of times we don't really see that where people are serving together. Not, maybe not side by side, but together with a purpose. And it's awesome. It really is. It's so um, awesome. I think what you get used to, Dan, is that we have the power couples in this in this studio a lot. A lot. So that's, get why, you get, that's why you guys are here. Anyway, this has been a really great episode. We're very thankful for y'all. And we'll see you next Friday on Winning Conversations.